Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Total Biscuit. Time for another vlog. Haven't done one of those in a while, so let's discuss various things, shall we? That sounds like a good idea, doesn't it? Yes. Well, it probably isn't. It's an excuse for me to rabbit on as usual. <sighs> okay, what's going on? Well, you'll see over the next couple of weeks that myself and a number of the Polaris folks are involved in a Smite Defend the Noob tournament, which involves, I believe, ten different channels. And it'll be presented in a best of three format. The idea is that four people who are at least relatively familiar with Smite will defend someone who isn't. In this case, it will be Dodger and Jesse as the noobs. I'll be on teams with people like Kutra, Peanut Butter Gamer, Krendor, and so on and so forth. Should be a decent amount of fun. Most of that will be found on the Polaris channel. The only video you're going to be getting on this channel will be a first-person perspective view that I'm going to put on this channel in the next couple of weeks. Most of it is going to be content filmed from the spectator view, which you'll be able to find on the Polaris channel. It was a pretty good time. We've already done the recording for it. I actually enjoyed it quite a lot. I mean, you know my opinions on Smite. I did content on that game years ago. I did my first assessment when it was in pre-alpha, for God's sake. I've been following it around for a while, so it's still fun. I'm still terrible at that game, though. I'm just disgustingly bad at it. I suppose that's what comes from trying to do three games at once, trying to play Smite, Dota 2, and Heroes of the Storm, and trying to be good at each of them, but yet mastering none. Speaking of Dota 2, that new update is looking fairly interesting, isn't it? I'm actually going to have to play a lot more now. It, it seems like they're changing the game around completely with the addition of the bounty runes and changes to the items and reworks of several major heroes. Jeez. It is interesting, to say the least. And more importantly, perhaps, they reduced the price of Town Portal Scrolls. Wonderful. Uh, as someone that plays primarily support, I certainly thank you for that one. No doubt about that. So yeah, I'll dive back into that and have a look at the changes. That might very well revitalize the game. That's assuming that it needed revitalization to begin with. I'm told the Tinker's dying more, which is always a good thing in my book. All right. Okay, so on to some serious stuff then. So I'm actually going to be in hospital in October. It's going to be for five days and there's going to be... Well, it might be for three, but it's likely to be for five. And there's going to be a couple of days prep. So it's a pretty major surgery. Uh, for those who don't know, of course, I've gone through the first round of chemotherapy and radiation, which I reacted pretty well to, considering. And as a direct result, they've now hopefully shrunk the cancerous mass enough to be able to cut it out without doing too much damage. But I'm going to have to be in hospital for a few days while they keep an eye on me and make sure that everything's fine. And I'm probably going to be pretty shaken up as a result because, you know, it's, it's pretty invasive surgery. So there is most likely going to be a content gap on the channel. I just want to make you aware of the dates surrounding that so that people know exactly what's going on there. It looks like it's basically going to be the week of the 6th of October onwards, right? It's most likely going to be that entire week where there's not going to be anything going on. And of course, I will not be doing the podcast, I don't think, that week, although it might be possible. It depends. They're doing a bunch of stuff prior to that that might put me out of action, but we will see. So just don't expect anything that week and maybe the week after because I just don't know how quickly I'm going to recover from it. After that's done, I start what is hopefully the final round of chemo, which will actually be IV and it's going to be for four months. Again, I don't know how it's going to affect me. The first round of chemo was pretty intensive, but I dealt with it fine, really. I mean, there was mild discomfort and I was tired a bit, which de definitely interfered with my workload. There's no doubt about that, but... It didn't interfere that much, so I think hopefully it'll be fine. But I'm not gonna I'm not gonna claim that I'm gonna be able to get through it without any problems. So just be aware that that's going on. And if there is any missing content or there's days where I'm not posting videos, you can pretty much just point to that as the reason. Anyway, depressing stuff out of the way. I'm sure I'll soldier through it just fine. Hopefully by 2015, I'll be back on my feet, fully healthy, and we'll be attending events again, which. I would say that would be nice, but it's actually been kind of cool not to go to them. <laughs> I'm going to be honest with that. Stuff like PAX and E3 is just a nightmare. Uh, but it still, that's the kind of thing you got to do. So there you go. I'd like to do some more Stark of Two casting as well. I think that's the thing that I currently miss the most, just because I don't really want to commit to any long streams, because I usually just don't have the energy. I can work, but asking me to cast for like 10 hours, that's something that I can't really do right now. Alright, so outside of that, what else is going on? Well, we've got the Steam curation thing up, and uh, as of the time of recording this, we passed 150,000 followers. That makes us, I believe, bigger than the next six curators on Steam put together. The follower count is actually ridiculous, and I'd of course like to thank everybody that's decided to follow me on the Steam curators list, and decided that my recommendations are worthy of your time. As I mentioned in the video, there are no kickbacks for any of that. You don't actually get any money 
for the curation service, which is a, a bit strange because that's the kind of thing that they were talking about doing a couple of years ago. They were talking about allowing users to create their own stores within a store, and you would get a certain portion of the revenue from that, and probably a very small amount knowing Valve. But it doesn't seem like they've gone that way. And I'm not too unhappy about that, honestly. When I looked at that, of course, I look at it as, hey, this is an incredible chance to make money. But also, simultaneously, there are huge ethical concerns tied into that. Whatever the case, I'm glad that I don't really have to make that decision right now. I don't get any kickbacks or anything for the Axiom sponsorship of GOG either. And I like to keep it that way because there is the real potential for bias involved in that. Whereas if it's just, hey, yeah, use this store, which I use anyway, then I don't really see the problem with it. Yeah, outside of that, what we've got is a system that allows you to put games in a recommended list, and those recommendations will pop up on the front page for people that follow you. They'll also pop up on the Steam Store page for that title, even if you're not being followed. And some people have a problem with that, but I really view it as a box quote. That's really all it is. Every game on Steam, for the most part, has various box quotes from websites, yeah? And it's the same quotes that you get on the back of a physical box, which is why I call them box quotes. And they come from websites like Destructoid, Kotaku, Rock, Paper, Shotgun, and so on and so forth. Now, it's fairly rare that a YouTuber actually gets a quote up there. It's usually just more traditional media sources. But with the recommended system, the curation system, you're now able to get a quote up there, and it's not controlled by the publisher or developer, which is actually good for the consumer. Outside of that, those quotes were very, very carefully picked and vetted, and some of them were actually edited and misrepresented. Stuff coming from preview articles as opposed to proper reviews, or even something that was said on a live stream or something ridiculous like that. Uh, they can be quite misleading, whereas I feel that recommendations for the most part are not going to be. So I personally, although I'm in a very biased position, obviously, don't think there's anything wrong with a recommendation popping up on a store page, on the specific game store page, if you don't follow that particular curator. I think that's fine, as long as you're not being pestered by recommendations on your main page for people that you haven't followed. But yeah, you can follow the curation page if you want. It's tinyurl.com slash cynicalsteam. That's tinyurl.com slash cynicalsteam. For those asking, I do have a number of concerns about the system, and I think there's a lot of improvements that could be made to it, but I'd like to save that for a separate video. I'm also trying to put together a podcast with game developers, games journalists, and PR folks to talk about the system, and I currently have several guests prepared to try and record that next week. I just really need one more indie dev for the panel, and I think we'll be absolutely golden. So that is going to be happening. I want to do more stuff like that when I get the chance, actually have shows which are dedicated to talking with industry people about various issues. I firmly believe that an informed consumer is a good consumer and that it will benefit the industry if we have more informed consumers. So I think the best way that I can do that is to use this channel as a sort of summit ground for a lot of these issues. And as I said before, I'd love to get people together to talk about journalistic integrity and the issues surrounding the Gamergate hashtag, but I've been met with either denials of my requests or walls of silence, so it, unfortunately that doesn't seem like that's something that's going to happen, I'm afraid. Alright, moving on. The issues with the Maker Shop. So, a lot of you, it seems, had problems getting your 60 FPS shirt, and it was the most successful sale that we've ever had, and yet tons of people had problems Either shirts were getting sent late, there was a batch of posters that were pixelated in a hint of terrible irony, and the email box was flooded with justifiable complaints as a result. So I went pretty heavy on the guys at Maker Shop and basically said, you need to resolve this stuff immediately to the satisfaction of everybody. I want to see everybody receiving their goods and a personal apology, otherwise I'm never doing business with you again. I'm willing to give them one more shot, but if they're going to do that, they need to make certain assurances publicly, and of course to you guys as well, and provide some sort of compensation, which I'm currently working out with them at the moment. If you still haven't received your shirts, please do email mailbox at cynicalbrit.com with your order number, and I will personally chase all of those up for you and make sure that that gets sorted out. I, the whole thing was just completely unacceptable. Apparently, they decided to use an outsourced shipping firm because of the number of shirts involved, and there were some massive screw-ups on their end. That's what they're claiming at any rate, but frankly, I don't view their customer support as good enough, which is weird because Rodeo Arcade, which is the same company, by the way, they just changed the name, was really, really good at that. We've never really had complaints about our merchandise before this one. 
So maybe it was just a one-off, but yeah, I want real assurances and compensation handed out for that stuff, and I'm working on getting that for you. And please accept my personal apology. As far as I'm concerned, the buck stops with me when it comes to my merchandise, even if I'm not the one responsible for making and shipping it. So anyone that was affected by that, please accept my apologies. That was just unacceptable. And that's not the kind of thing that anyone should expect when dealing with our channel. All right, moving on. So I think we're going to be sticking with the current format for Impress Me, which I'm now going to be calling 15 Minutes of Game. Because, hey, we've changed it to a three-game, 15-minute format. It seems to work well. I think we've hit the sweet spot in terms of length. And I don't find myself repeating myself too much. I, th I know there's a bit of an irony in that sentence there, but I don't find myself repeating myself too much, <laughs> okay? I could just keep doing this and it would still be funny, or, or maybe that's just me. Whatever the case, I think that it works out pretty well. I don't repeat myself all that often in that series. If I stretch it out to 20 minutes, particularly on bad games, I find myself running out of things to say. So we're going to keep doing that, and it's going to be a format that allows us to cover more indie games on the channel that maybe I just... Games that I'm not really interested in enough to actually do a full-on WTF is of and that also allows me to reserve the WTF is format to try and focus on games that I am really interested in and they may be triple A's they may be indies depends on the format I recently did reprisal universe and as far as I'm concerned that was a really good choice. Why was it a really good choice? Well, because I loved Populous back in the day, and I wanted to play a god game. Reprisal Universe was one, and yeah, it ended up not being a hugely interesting title, but I was still potentially interested in it. Things like Train Fever on Roundabout, same idea there. Whereas your average tower defense game, unless of course it's called Defense Grid 2, which I will be looking at in a full WTF is at some point, is probably not going to rate too highly on the radar of things that I really want to spend a lot of time with. We get a lot of games every single week. There's tons of runners, tons of platformers, tons of tower defense games, mobile ports, and all sorts of things that end up in our inbox, and we'd like a way to cover a decent number of them without over committing time. And I think that seems to be the way to do it. The, the fact of the matter is that this all ties in nicely to the way curation is right now. Steam is going to open the floodgates. I eventually expect them, and they announced they would do this, for them to close Greenlight and go to a self-publishing model, which means there's going to be even more stuff on Steam, which means there is even greater need for formats that allow us to look at a lot of different games in a short period of time. And yes, they may not be the fairest formats. But ultimately, what choice do we really have? Not even big websites can cover all of these games. They're not even covering a fraction of them. So how could a one or two man company or YouTube channel do it? Well, we have the power, I think, to elevate these games and give them the exposure that they deserve, assuming they're any good. But we need to do it in a way that's business savvy. And I think that this format works pretty well. So moving on, I'm actually going to be getting rid of the Cynical Rig Mac 3. It's going to be going to my wife so that she can move off her laptop. And we're building a new rig. It is the Cynical Rig Mac 4, and it is based on the new X99 platform. We've got a 5930K for it. We have 16 gigs of DDR4, the 2800 Corsair Vengeance LPX RAM. It's actually a bit of a downgrade for us because I'm used to using 32, but frankly, none of my software uses all of that. So I think 16 will be fine. And honestly, the price of DDR4 right now is so frankly ridiculous that I don't really see a reason to go full 32. It also makes overclocking a little bit more difficult because right now if you want to go up to 32, chances are you're going to do it with 8 sticks of RAM. And if one of those sticks of RAM is not quite up to the speed of the others, well that drags you the hell down. So we'll stick with 16 for the time being and we are aiming to overclock. I'm putting a Swiftec H320 in this thing, which is a triple fan radiator and it is well reviewed. I mean, outside of buying a custom loop, it's probably one of the better CPU coolers you can actually get. It's very, very effective, and it's pretty quiet as well. I mean, reviews-wise, it's got nothing but praise, so it looks like it is a good option. And that's a bit of an upgrade from my H100, which is not quite as powerful by any stretch of the imagination. So this time around, we're going to try and overclock. I'm aiming for about 4.5 gigahertz. That seems like a reasonable overclock with the kit that I've got. I'm going to shoot for around that, make sure we can get it stable. That's always the most important part. I've run stock this generation simply because stability was king. Like if I had an encode bust up in the middle of the night because I had an unstable system because my overclock wasn't quite right or I had some overheating problems, then that would mess with my workload. You know, that would cause a real problem. But this time around, I think we can overclock without busting everything up. So yeah, it should be good. Now, on top of that, it will be on the Rampage 5 platform, so that's a 
fairly high-end motherboard. I think it's the highest-end motherboard you can currently get for the X99 platform. It's got a lot of nice features for overclocking. It's a little bit OTT, I've got to admit, but it looks pretty good nonetheless. And we're putting two GTX 980s in that, so that is an upgrade from the Titans. You'd be surprised to realize that maybe, but yes, they are actually quite a bit better than the Titans. You know, maybe some people would view them as marginal. I mean, it's not like Titans can't play everything. They can, but especially with a lot of bad PC ports, if you want to get that really good frame rate experience, it seems like the amount of horsepower you need is astronomical. And this is particularly true if you're looking to move past 1080p resolutions. So putting a couple of 980s in there and they should hopefully do the job. And that'll be backed up by a couple of SanDisk Extreme Pro SSDs and then you know, just a couple of two terabyte drives that I use for saving footage and managing all of my files and things like that. It should be a fairly reasonable upgrade. It seems to me that CPU clock speed is very, very important at the moment. And frankly, I found that most of the applications that I use don't even use my processor properly, even Adobe Premiere. You, you'd think that it would. You'd think that it would be able to use all six cores and properly hyperthread, but the bloody thing doesn't. Now, I've got a lot of encodes that are using maybe 35% CPU time. It's like, come on, I've got more power. Give it, you know, take it. And yet it bloody well would not, so... Yeah, clock speed seems to be king on a lot of ports right now, so I'm gonna push that up as high as I can get, so that'll hopefully mean higher frame rates. This is gonna be particularly important once YouTube moves over to 60 FPS, which hopefully is gonna be soon, because I wanna move all my WTFs to 60 FPS going forward, but as of right now, we have no idea when that feature is actually being launched. Outside of that, things seem to be trucking along quite nicely. I am going to give you a recommendation, by the way. If you have Netflix, especially in the US, which is probably the only place that's available right now, though I could be wrong, do watch Blacklist. It is pretty damn good. <laughs> I mean, most of the things that have James Spader in are, but Blacklist in particular is extremely entertaining. So I'm a big fan of that one. Like it a lot. Good plot twists, and obviously James Spader's character, as usual, is absolutely fantastic. This is coming from someone that adored Boston Legal. It's probably in my top five TV series of all time, and uh, James Spader's character was obviously one of the highlights of that. Also, as you may have heard me mention on the podcast, if you're the kind of person that doesn't like general anime tropes, like me, for instance, but you maybe want to watch an anime anyway, I would recommend Psychopaths, which seems to avoid all of them. In fact, it could have been a live-action series and been just fine. It is a detective series set in the future where everybody's mental state is monitored via an omnipotent supercomputer system, and your emotional state can be read via your psychopaths. There's a small detective unit whose job it is to attempt to enforce the law against those whose psychopaths has gone cloudy, and that means they are either going to commit a crime or they are currently doing so right now. A lot of crazy conspiracy in it, a lot of fairly philosophical conversations, which I liked a lot. It's at least pretending to be smart if it isn't. Good cast of characters, really compelling antagonist, and a very high-tension series. So if, if you like the high tension and not knowing who exactly is going to drop dead next, then Psychopaths is certainly worth watching, at least in my opinion. Not much of an anime reviewer, I have to admit. You want to talk to Dodger about that, but that's one of the few anime that I actually like watching, so there you go. All right, folks, that pretty much wraps me up for this vlog. Thank you very much for watching. Hopefully it has at least been in some way informative. And do remember to follow us on the Steam Curation Service, tinyurl.com slash cynicalsteam. I'll see you next time.
team has destroyed a left in a Oh, I apologize sincerely. Good game.